Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at Node School. We're on to level 8 and we're looking at the pointiness node in particular, a bit more about colour ramps and a bit more about blending modes. Do make sure you've checked out the previous versions. I'll be using the Node Wrangler, which again I talk about in previous versions, so make sure you've got that installed. Do also check my other playlists in the description below. And you may have seen a bit of this technique when I was talking about texturing of the hunting knife just recently. So you can check that out as well if you want to see a practical application. Okay, so I'm in the basic scene and I'm going to delete the default cube and add in with Shift A to add Mesh Monkey. The monkey is going to help us because it's got lots of crevices, so we'll really be able to see the full effect. I'm just going to put this on a floor. So Shift A to add Mesh Plane and scale that up and move my monkey so it looks like it's resting on the floor. Lastly, I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier to my monkey. The shortcut for that is Control-3, and you can see over here in my modifiers that I've added a subdivision surface modifier with three levels. If I press Control-4, then it will add four levels, and so on. I think three is enough for this, and it's worth saying you must be in the viewport to press Control-3 for, or whatever, to change it over here. If I press Control-3 over here, it doesn't do anything. So we've got a nice monkey, I'm going to right click and shade smooth so it's completely nice and smooth as well. What I'm going to do is drag this bottom timeline up and change it across to the shader editor. And press N to get rid of the toolbar at the end there. Now the reason I did that, if I go to shading, you can see we've got these two boxes that I don't really need. Rather than join them together, I thought I'd do that in the basic layout. So very slightly different, but nothing too difficult. Okay, so I'm going to change across to my render and it looks very flat at the moment. We're going to need an HDRI in the background, so I'll quickly set that up. I've done this all in the previous episode, so you should have no problem setting this up by yourself. So there's an HDRI in the background, and I'm going to go across to Cycles Render Engine. So under the Render Properties, change it to Cycles, and I'm going to use my GPU. Now the reason I'm doing that is because the node we're using today, the pointiness node, only works in cycles, unfortunately. It's relatively new in the last couple of years that it's been added. Hopefully, they'll figure out some way to add it to Eevee soon. So back to object, just quickly turn on overlays and make sure that my monkey is selected. And that's great. I'll turn those off again now and create a new material. I'll drag this up a bit. And you notice we've got all this area here and here, which it's rendering, but is unnecessary. What I'm going to do is a new technique, Control B, and create a box around my monkey, and that will limit the rendering to that area. If you want to get rid of that box, it's Control Alt B. So remember that Alt is the kind of undo command. So Control B to draw out my box. It saves a bit of time and processing effort. I'm going to actually go across to the viewport sampling and turn the samples up slightly for the viewport render, just so we can see with a bit more detail. Now the very last thing I'm going to do is click on the floor and give that a darker material. It will help us to see what's going on a bit better. So I'll click on the monkey once more. So I'll introduce you to the pointiness node, Shift A to add, input, and it's under geometry. So it's a bit tricky to search for this one because if you type in pointiness, it comes up with this. It's actually under the geometry, which is there, but that's under input. Okay, and here is our pointiness. There's a few useful things there, but pointiness is the one we're looking at today. And I'll plug that in. Now you can't see much happening, and there's a reason that it needs a sort of clamping. So we need to bring up the blacks and bring down the whites. Have a think what we can use to do that. Now that may have been quite a tough question as it's a bit of a difficult one to describe, but Shift A to add, and it's under converter, we're adding a color ramp. Okay, so that brings in the blacks and pulls in the whites. Well done if you managed to get that. So I am going to do just that, pull up the blacks, and you can sort of see a change happening here. Pull in my whites. Don't worry too much about the numbers at the moment. And can we see some slight effect? It's quite tricky to see. I'm gonna pull them in really close so we can see exactly what's going on. Uh, try not to go past five or midway. Can you see how much it changed suddenly to black then? So I'm going to go to as close as I can without crossing the middle. I can zoom in on this as well, which will help me. Okay, so what you can hopefully see is there's some shadows in the crevices. Certainly you'll see that within here. And there's some lightness or brightness on the extremities of the shape. I'll try and squeeze them in a bit more. If I hold down shift over the position and drag across, I can get a bit closer to five on each of them. I'll click on the black and do the same. 
and you can see a bit more of that effect now, squeezing together, the crevices are going dark, and the extremities of the shape are going bright and lighter. So that's what the pointiness node does, and this can be very, very useful. It adds a weathered look to objects, because often the wind, rain, and weather effects will hit the extremities and wear them away, so they become more shiny, brighter, and the crevices get dirt and less of that wear, so they're usually a bit darker. So this is very useful for adding a bit of realism. Now what I was showing you there about pulling them in really close is actually quite awkward and there's a better way of doing it. So if I come out a bit and move these across, what I'm going to do is set my color amp to 0.4 and 0.6 respectively. So the whites I'll bring up to about 0.6 and the blacks to about 0.4. This seems to be a sort of magic number with the pointiness node. Now if I get my color amp and duplicate it and pull it across, so Shift D to duplicate, I'm actually doubling up the color amp. So it's sort of looking at this area here and then having a color amp for just that area. So if I bring these back to the beginning and then I mute this node, you can see very little difference. But as I start changing it, it's kind of changing this area in here so we can be a bit more precise. And now we're starting to really see the effect and it's sort of doubling up on this effect in a way. And we can really see the highlights of the shape popping and the dirty crevices. Okay, so what I want you to do now as a quick challenge is to make the highlights blue and the cavities red. Have a go at that. Okay, now you may have initially thought that changing the colors in the color ramp would be the easy way to do that. And it does certainly work. You can change the colors in the color ramp and we can do just that. But if I undo that for a moment, there's a slightly more effective way. If I'm already happy with what I've got here, I can move these across slightly Set up a mix RGB, so Shift A to add, color, and then mix RGB. Remember there's two types of mix node, the shader mix node, so mix shader, and the color mix node, which is the mix RGB. So I can come into here, and if I plug this into the factor, it goes completely white because we've just got two white textures here, but I can change these two textures now. So I can change the top one, which is the black information to something like a red, and the bottom one, which is the white information to something like a blue. And rather than having to fiddle around with these two colors, I can have the color ramp controlling the difference. Then if I want to mix all these together with another node, I can copy these color ramps across without any color information in them and just change the mix node, rather than having to go in and change the black and white values here or here. Now this isn't quite the fullest use of the pointiness node. I'll get rid of this mix node for now and plug my pointiness back into the color. Now what we want is to be able to use this to help add some contrast to our models. So like I say, those sort of light bits and dark bits being shadow or worn bits and dirty crevices. So what we're going to do is create a new material to go into our base color. And then we're going to use these to affect the lightness and darkness of that model. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is try and set up a monkey with an interesting texture like this. And then we'll see if we can make the pointiness node affect this model in an effective way. So have a go at making that. Okay, so I'll show you my settings. Fairly straightforward, a wave texture. You can see my scale, distortion, and detail level there. Going into a color ramp to create these interesting sort of wavy textures. And I've added lots of points to my color ramp so the texture has variation within it. If you came up with something close to this, then well done. Now let's see if we can get our pointiness node to have some influence on this color. So let's move these across slightly. And the way we're going to mix these together is with a mix node. So if I press Control Shift right click and drag between the two, it creates a mix node for us. Remember, you must have the Node Wrangler installed for that to work. Edit Preferences, Add-ons, Node Wrangler. Make sure it's ticked. So I'll open up the mix shader, come into this, and now we can mix between our pointiness node. And remember, full or one is the bottom one, and nothing or zero is the top one. And we can blend between the two also remember that you can plug black and white information into this, and the white would be one, and the black would be zero. Now if I put the factor all the way up to one, we only see the bottom, which is our pointiness node. However, we have some blend modes here. Now there's three I want to talk about today, overlay, screen, and multiply. Screen lightens the image, so it will take the light bits from this and make this lots lighter. So let's do that now, screen, and you can see it makes it very bright, especially on the highlights. You can see they're a bit brighter, a little bit tricky to see on this. Let's try the multiply. 
which makes it darker. So it takes those black bits and makes them darker. And the last one is the overlay. Now that does a bit of both, but you can see it's affecting the color more than let's say the multiply, which is pushing it towards black. It gives it quite a nice look, this multiply effect, and it's often used as a sort of ambient occlusion effect. The most commonly used are the multiply and the overlay. The overlay is a bit more subtle with how it does it, and it will lighten the edges as well. Now if I take the same effect and add it to this dragon model that I was playing with recently, you can really see the cavities and the extremities coming out with that overlay node. In fact, this is quite extreme, and I probably wouldn't need the second one so much. But you're certainly able to see the help it's giving the cavities and the extremities in this particular situation. You can layer these up as well. So at the moment, it's just an overlay. It's taking this base color, which is the base color of the dragon, let's say, and then taking the pointiness information into the bottom node and overlaying it. And we could also add the multiply or the screen, but we could use a combination. So let's select this and move it across to the side. The first one I'll use the overlay. I'll duplicate this, Shift D to duplicate, and that will go into the top one, so that's our main one. So at the moment this is an overlay with just white being overlaid, so not much is changing. But if I bring this in and change this to the multiply, you can see it's doing an overlay first and then the multiply second. So it's adding a bit more shading to the crevices. So if I control shift left click on the overlay, you can see the original effect of that overlay on this blue and then control shift left click on the multiply. You can see that it's increased those crevices. I can layer this up even further. So shift D to duplicate, place it in the middle here. Again, it's not making much difference at the moment because it's multiplying with white. So we shouldn't see any difference from this one to this one. So we're seeing this one at the moment through the viewer node. If I control shift left click on this one, it does make a small amount of difference, but that's to do with the color space. So don't worry too much about that, but let's plug this in and enable screen. And then through the principled BSDF and we can see our final output. The screen is heavily influencing the object. So we can pull this down a bit further. So it's not as severe. And then we've got quite an interesting looking dragon. Remember, if you want to change anything about the color, you just have to plug it into this first color slot. So if I want to change the color in any way, you can see it changing there. So let's look at our original material and perhaps use this wave texture. I'll press control C to copy that. Click on my dragon, control V to paste and plug that into the front there. And now we've got a weird sort of porcelain dragon. Okay, so have a good play around with that. Try and find some objects which have some nice crevices. It works really nicely with sculpted objects. One final note is that the more geometry you have, the better it is. It will struggle a little bit if it's got a small amount of faces. So have fun, experiment, get across to the Discord server and share your work there. Remember to tag me, Grant, so that I can easily see it. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.